Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tuesday's edition of Locked on Seminole. Sorry I wasn't here yesterday, but I know, like Allstate, you were in great hands. But I'm here today. I'm Max. That's Drake. And together, we are two of the three that bring you Locked on Seminoles every single day of the week. We've been covering this team for, I don't know, 18 months now. In fact, we just had our one-year anniversary of officially being Locked on Seminoles. And we are here to talk about the things we need a break from. It's spring break after, uh, I think, a Sunday walkthrough or a Saturday walkthrough. The team is going on spring break, and we're going to talk about what we need a break from seeing this team do on the field if we're going to make it through this season. After that, we're going to get into two for Tuesdays. We're going to talk about the most important duo on the offense and the most important duo on the defense. Drake, roll the video, and let's dive in. It's good hands, Max. You are Locked On Seminoles, your daily podcast on the Florida State Seminoles, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Folks, upgrades to insurance company slogans aside, thank you for being here today. As we said, I'm Max at MaxMoody17 on Twitter. That is at Tally underscore underscore Drake. We love that you are here because we get to talk about the team because you tune in and make us your first listen each and every day. If you're on YouTube, make sure you subscribe, like the video, and turn on notifications. If you are on the podcast, a five-star review never hurt anyone. So tell us what you love about the show. Today's episode is brought to you by Stat Hero. Stat Hero is changing the way you play fantasy sports. Dozens of house-based games to play daily. No sharks, no funky props, just your skill versus the lineups you choose. Sign up today at stathero.com slash locked on. Well, let's get locked on to this episode, Drizzy. Today, the team is on spring break as we're talking, which I don't think we need to get into that. But I, why don't they just do, why a week of practice and then spring break? Why not? You know, doesn't that seem a little weird? Know. It's dumb, man. You're gonna. Or why you not know. make them stay? Like in high school, our baseball team, I remember, all stayed for spring break because they had some important tournament. It's a little bizarre. Um, I mean, I think because you're not supposed to treat student athletes differently than the rest of the student body. So, like, if you can't, if you're not giving them a break during spring break, you're treating them differently than the rest of the student population. And that, like, I know the NCAA has gotten a lot of flack for certain things, but like, that's one thing you don't want to be doing. Is the, is the end of the semester the constraint then? Like, can they not run four straight weeks after spring break without believe, running into exams, maybe? I believe so, but I'm going to have to double-check on that to give you the right answer, because on the top of my head, I don't remember. I don't It doesn't matter, but let's talk about what we need a break from with this team. Drake, what do you need a break from seeing on the field from this football team in 2022? Is it on the field or is it kind of do the fan base either? either oh, you could do either one. We had brainstormed a potential of both and I just swung with on the field. But what do you need a break from from this fan base? Well, I mean, on the field, I think the one thing that I need to see and I'm going to look at the coaching staff in general is just perplexing coaching decisions. And I say that primarily is like for some reason, I always feel that there's one moment in each game last year that we could point to where we feel that the moment was too big for Mike Norvell. And at the moment, I don't mean the game. I think the moment if it's him being a a head coach at the power five level. I remember we saw the uh, the time the timeout that he shouldn't have taken probably a little bit earlier for Fitzgerald in the Notre Dame game in OT. Then you Man. see the decline holding penalty, I think it was NC State, where he probably should have taken that. If we're totally being honest here. So like there's there's a moment in each and every single game where like I'm like, Mike, why? It, it's, and it's not because like it's a bad decision, but it's more like after the game is over, it's like, why did you do that? You can't really explain to me in the best of certain terms, like why you went that route. So for on the field, primarily, I need to see an improvement in in in-game decisions by the coaching staff. Yeah, well, I mean, I think a good example of that too, even is Jacksonville State. Remember they went for it on fourth and one on their own goal line. It's like, just kick a field goal there. That was what we talked about Jacksonville State, where it's like half the time they were playing Jacksonville State, half the time they were pretending they were playing Alabama. And it's like, don't throw a fade on fourth and goal against an FCS team, just if you're going to go for it, just run up the middle or take your points and like, you know, get out of there. But anyway, I think for me, what, what I need to break from, from the fan base is this whole idea that if he isn't Heisman winning caliber, Jordan Travis is not a good quarterback. It's like Jordan Travis has become such a scapegoat for the woes of this program. And like anything he does that isn't perfect. It's like, ah, that's why we're bad. 
And guys, I hate to break it to you, but you put Joe Burrow on this team last year, you probably win eight games. You maybe sneak a ninth one in there. But with the offensive line that was in front of, actually, probably don't because he probably tears his ACL in the fifth game. But, you know, with the offensive line in front of him and the receivers you had last year, there was not a quarterback, including the big man upstairs himself, that was going to take you to an ACC championship last year. We were so close so many times because of Jordan Travis, but then we also just, we didn't have the team to go the distance. And what I need a break from on the field is I need a break from one yard or two yard first down plays. Just, just be more successful on first down. And what, what perplexes me is that there were so many times last year where their third down conversion rate wasn't nearly as bad as it should have been. What I mean by that is if you looked at their average start on third down and then their third down conversion rate, you wouldn't think you were looking at the same team stats. So if you can get all these third and eights and third and nines, why can't you just get three and four yards on first and second downs instead of making yourself get in third and nine? So I need, I need a break from that. I mean, I, I can kind of get one of that. My only thing is though, with Jordan Travis, I don't want people to confuse that even though Jordan Travis is the only option on actually on the team. I also don't think that he, to me, he's not a top five ACC quarterback. To me, I probably put him at eight or seven in my personal Jeez, opinion. Jeez, that's a yeah. yeah and in the and, ACC, I mean, I th- well, one the ACC already has a, a good plethora of QBs right now. We're gonna say top five in the nation, eighth in the AC. There's only twelve teams, or but there's fourteen. There's only twelve we're talking about. You got Duke and Syracuse. You got seven quarterbacks in the ACC ahead of him. Yeah, probably. Who? Devin Leary. Okay. Bill Dracovic. No, Brandon Armstrong. Dracovic has worse injury problems Sam than Jordan Hartman. Travis, and when he does get hurt, he can't play through it. Dracovic is not a better quarterback than Travis. Maybe he's a better, better, maybe a better thrower of the ball in drills, but he's not a better quarterback. I mean, he was only hurt for last season. You would so, rather have he didn't play the season before. That's why he had to transfer. He so played. Have, he played last season at, at Boston College. No, no, I'm saying the year before he didn't play. That's why he had to transfer to Boston College from Notre Dame. He's been in Boston College for two years. Did he? Yeah. Yeah, I'll give you that. What were his stats the year before? I don't like remember him being anything. Didn't he have Anthony, didn't he have Anthony Brown in front of him the year before that then? Uh, Anthony Brown, I think, transferred in when he came in. 2020, yeah. He came to Boston College. He played 10 games, 336 passing yards, 61%. All right, but all right. Still last year, he threw 96 times, had a 54% completion percentage, 900 yards, what, seven touchdowns to four picks. Dude, you're telling me you'd rather have that on our team last year than Jordan Travis? 100%. 50, 54% completion on only 96 throws, and he's seven for four and touchdowns to picks. He did, that with, he, he did that with a broken wrist. Jordan breaks everything, and he's still out there. Meanwhile, you got Travis out there. Like, are you, like you, once you account for the legs, I don't even know how this is a competition. And if he broke his wrist behind that offensive line for Boston College, what the hell is going to happen to him behind our offensive line? 1,500 yards, 15 touchdowns to six interceptions. Percentage wise, it's better. Longevity, it's better. There, there's literally no measure hurt by once. Which... Jordan has been hurt every single year he's been in college football. He was hurt at Louisville. He was hurt the Hell, first season against Taggart. He was hurt anymore. last year, and he was hurt the this past year too. Yeah, but he's also got to do so much that we need his legs, and he still comes back in. So whether he powers through, he's hurt. All right, whatever. We can agree. Sane minds can differ. I don't think Phil Dracovic. I, I would not at this moment replace Jordan Travis with Phil Dracovic. Um, I just Sam Harmon's? No. Dude, Sam Hartman's a fun story. It's cool to watch how he rallies his team, but Sam Hartman's not legit. He's just not. I, there's just some, I'm with Dave on this. I know this is a very Dave take, but like, there's it's just Wake something Forest. about Hartman. <laughs> yeah, like there's something about he gets the Wake Forests of the world vibing and they're would, all would you, going. Would, would you feel different if he was on a different team? <laughs> I don't Probably, think right? Be, yeah, maybe. I mean, because if we're being honest, like, he's also lost Nate, his well, own starting job on his team multiple times. Like, well, Jamie he's not Newman. even Wake Forest's first option. Well, he's Jamie. also never had. Hang on, I know Jamie Newman. Proceed. Yeah, Jamie, but, Jamie Newman. He lost the job to him, who transferred to Georgia to be their starting QB until COVID hit. Fair, but okay, he didn't end up starting in Georgia. And then also, Sam Hartman's never completed over sixty percent of his passes. He throws so, the ball more. Well, he throws the ball a lot. Forty-two hundred yards last year, which also I think I looked this up at one point. Well, it's about like seventh or eighth in the nation overall yards. So yeah, I guess statistically is up there, but like it's. Know, it's just it's, it's more just I'm not if you don't throw the ball, I guess <sighs> around 25 times a game, 
And also your completion percentage is around 60. Doesn't mean that much to me, especially when on only three games last year, you only had 200 yards, total yards. So it's like those, that completion percentage, I think is really, it's easily, easily inflated to show how much of like an improvement Jordan Travis made. Did he make an improvement? Substantially. I think he was much better this past season than the year before. So like that's yeah. more like, I just think we got to be, I want the fan base to be a little more just like, Hey, Jordan is our best option we have on the team. That is correct. He's no one's arguing that. Primarily, but because but it mainly also is because there is no other option right now that we know certifiably is a better option for the team. So I think we just need to yeah. don't set ourselves up for failure. Or just don't set up ourselves for, up for, you know, comparing him to, you know, Heisman hopefuls of years past. You know what I'm I saying? I don't compare him to Heisman hopefuls. My point is I, I'm going one further than you is like, that's the narrative is like, oh, he's the best we've got. He's all we can do. I'm not going to blame him for the offense that we run. Okay. That's not up to him because we're not running. Like the only reason we get half the offense we do is because his legs are so much of a threat that these piss poor wide receivers are able to get some kind of open. Mike Norvell throws a ton of screen passes. Yes. You should have a higher completion percentage under him, but say there's seven quarterbacks in the ACC. Like that was three. You just named that was Devin Leary, mm-hmm. Phil Dracovich, which there is a very good argument that he's not better or that's not better than Jordan Travis. Even if we differ in our conclusion, there's still a lot of evidence in both directions. Mm-hmm. And then freaking Sam Hartman, who I just looked it up. You saw me mouth seventh was the seventh leading passer in the nation last year. Yeah. That's three guys. That's not eighth in the ACC. Well, you didn't let me finish. Fourth. Okay. Keep going. Brandon Armstrong. Who the hell is Brandon Armstrong? Brennan, quarterback for Virginia. Oh, give me a break. Malik Cunningham. Yeah, okay. I'll give you Malik Cunningham. In fact, Malik Cunningham should be like third on your list. What are you talking about? I'm no, I'm not I'm not saying an order. I'm just saying like who I have in front of him. But Brandon Malik Armstrong. Cunningham honestly probably is the best QB. Brandon, how do you spell his name? I can't even Brennan. Like Bre- like like Brennan from Step Brothers. Like Brennan Huff. <laughs> Tyler Van Dyke. That's six. Tyler Van Dyke has higher potential. I don't think he's a better quarterback yet. I think he could be. I think Tyler Van Dyke's got to take a step forward this year. And and we don't know. We can't, we can't pencil in a step forward. You know what I mean? Like, I don't don't know if that's fair. Also, this guy, Brendan Armstrong. hmm. Okay. So he was fourth in the nation in passing yards last year. I had no idea this guy existed. That shows how much I know about our conference. Fourth in the nation in passing yards last year. So that's pretty nuts. Our conference last year had two of the top 10 passers in the country. And this is where me and you differ. I think DJ Wongalele, if like to me, I'm still holding out that this year could be the year he breaks out. Yeah, DJ's not good. I don't know. So to me, I don't want to go down the ratings in the in the ACC, but um, because that's not the point of this episode. But the only ones in there I'm going to give you, I mean, I guess this guy, Brennan Armstrong, you know, the whatever, 31 touchdowns to 10 picks, 4,400 yards. I can't argue with that. Sure. Didn't know you existed, but good for you. Um, Cunningham, probably, although I think he, I don't know if you swap Malik Cunningham and Jordan Travis on teams, which is like ironic because Jordan transferred from Louisville. If they have super different seasons, like I just, I just think their team was a little better this year, a little more complete, but Cunningham's good. And then, yeah, I mean, Tyler Van Dyke. I don't know. I did preface my ranking by saying that the ACC is very, very loaded with very good quarterbacks. So you shouldn't be that offended by yeah. me saying that Jordan Travis is seven. I, or I'm eight. not, I'm not offended. I just don't think, I think if I had time to sit down with a pen and paper and write some arguments out, I'm probably putting him at third or fourth, even in that list. Cause like, I think Van Dyke could take a step forward, but so could Travis. Right. So if we give them both equal improvement from last year, I think you got Travis still ahead of him. But anyway, that's uh, that's what I need a break from is this whole idea that like we're just settling for Travis and it's all we can do. I think he's a pretty good quarterback, and I think people will see that this year, just like last year. I said he was at least going to be your starter over Milton, and no one believed me, and people said I was crazy. But folks, if people are telling you you're crazy, and the brackets are not going your way, and things just aren't working out for you in the gaming space, well, Stat Hero is here to change it up, to make the game a little crazy, if you will. Stat Hero does an NCAA single game pick them that pits star players against each other. It's an amazing hybrid between fantasy sports and gambling. In addition to their pick them games, they also have dozens of lineups you can comb through and you can take on those lineups head to head with the lineup you come up with. They simply post sets of players for you to take on with a set of players you choose. It's the easiest and fastest way to get your sports action fixed. Stat Hero is the sleek and simple gameplay that will have you playing in minutes and it is what daily fantasy was meant to be so go to stathero.com slash locked on and use promo code 
locked on for a 100% deposit match. That's stathero.com slash locked on using promo code locked on. It's a lot of locked ons for a 100% match. Stathero.com slash locked on promo code locked on terms and conditions apply. All right, so all, all discussions aside, all things we need to break from are out of the way. Let's talk two for Tuesday. Drake, let's get right to it. Who do you think is the most important duo on the defensive side of the ball this year? Do you want me to go first? Or do you want to do two that you, you know? Yeah, steal? you go first. You have whoever you want. You can steal. Okay. I think the most important duo probably on the defensive side of the ball is the gruesome twosome right in the middle. I think it's going to be Tatum Bethune. And I think it's going to be Kalen DeLoach. And primarily because Kalen DeLoach was obviously our best coverage linebacker last year. He was arguably our best linebacker overall last year. Amari Gaynor, he improved, but there's still some, you know, coverages we have with him. We have Brendan Gant and Jadarius Green McKnight, who are both being converted from safety. But Tatum Bethune apparently already is like lights out of practice. He's rocking a black jersey, I think, in the first week of tour of duty, which is something huge. And that's something we haven't seen since Jermaine Johnson last year. And we saw how that turned out. He brings over 115 tackles, about, I think, 12 sacks, sacks from the past year. So to me, Tatum Bethune is going to be probably a leader alongside Kalen Deloach to look guard up the middle. So to me, it's going to be Tatum Bethune and Kalen Deloach. Yeah, and I'm staying right in the middle. My uh, my gruesome twosome is going to be the Fabian Lovett, Robert Cooper duo. I mean, we're already hearing that Coop is Coop. I mean, he's a big dude, whatever. Um, he's great. And then Fabian Lovett, all reports are that he is taking another step forward. I mean, Fabian came in, what, three years ago, right before the COVID, or two years ago, before the COVID year. And in 2020, he was kind of, I, I don't want to say average, but he was average. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't anything special. And then we kind of heard last year he was taking a step forward, and we really saw that emerge last year. And now we're hearing, okay, everyone I talk to says he's doing it again. He's improving again. And I think when you have him and Coop in the middle, my only concern is, can these young guys give them enough relief so they're not playing 60 snaps a game, that's tough for the big boys. They could do it, but you don't want them to have to do it. So other than that, that is my most important duo. I think if you have a strong middle and you have a couple, I mean, we've got what, a decent rotation of edge setters, right? We've got like Dennis Briggs over there. We're hearing decent things about verse. Um, who, who else we do got, we have? We got Quayshon Fuller also Quayshon on the other Fuller. side. Darren McClendon too is apparently yeah. putting in a work for a camp, which those are two kids that just named that I don't think any of us actually thought were going to be contributing members of the Florida State football program. And then we still have the young guns, like a Joshua Farmer is another one who, he, that kid has put on so much size in a year and a half. That kid is basically going to be your Fox, your, your Fox setter. He's going to be your Kier Thomas, going from the inside into the outside. And then you also have Sean Bray Jackson, Patrick Payton, George Wilson Jr. Like those are kids I'm very so excited to be actually be seeing. So like are we, our defensive end depth, is where it should be. I'm not going to say it's great because I would hope to, you know, we grab some more, you know, during the this next recruiting class, maybe grab one more transfer out there. But I do think the defensive line overall is in a much better position than it was starting up last year. Yeah, look, I think Jermaine Johnson will be remembered as one of the great Seminoles of all time, which is mind-blowing because he played one season. But it's keeping in mind when he played is, is what's going to contribute to the memory, like how how well and how fondly he's remembered. Because you should have a Jermaine like every year. And don't look at me, guys, and say, oh, well, you can't have someone like that. He was like one of the nation's leaders in sacks. Yeah, y'all also want a Heisman Trophy winner at quarterback every year. I'm allowed to want this. I do. You should have like a Brian Burns or, or a Jermaine Johnson. Like those kind of guys are just, you need one of those. Even if he's not leading the nation, you need someone every year that you know when that quarterback is holding that ball a little too long, you're about to hear his number called. And that's like what we, that's what we had with Brian Burns. And that's what we had with Josh Sweat. And that's what we like finally recaptured with, with, um, I almost said verse. I hope it's verse going forward, but that, that's what we kind of recaptured with Jermaine Johnson last year was like one Mississippi two Mississippi. You're like that quarterback, dude, we're about to hear, you know, we're about to hear 11's number, you know? And I think that a big part of that was you were getting such a solid team rush of Coop and love it up the middle uh, other big boys rotating in, and then you were getting a solid edge set on the other side, right? One guy can't do it all on his own. So I think Robert Cooper and Fabian Lovett are going to be very critical, not just to the success of stopping the run, but also the pass rushing success of those guys on the outside. Because if the middle is open and quarterbacks can just step up in the pocket, the guy on the outside can only do so much. So I yeah. want to go over, oh, sorry, cut. 
Oh no, I, I'm saying like I'm, I'm I, I am agreeing with you with that, and also like them up front will make it a lot easier for the linebackers to actually cover the middle, and that's something that's been sort of a, a was it a malignment that we've had actually for the past several seasons, like you know on the side of the ball, and then with me these these defensive linemen typically they're not supposed to like you know be that much of a threat up the middle with sacks. I think these two actually provide sort of not the actual you know automatic you know win getting a sack, but like the threat that that potentially can happen that we haven't seen since not saying the same caliber, but of an Eddie Goldman team in Jernigan that you know you have two monsters up the middle. So, like, to me, because I love Fabian Love, and yeah. I think Robert Cooper has gotten better each and every single year after, you know, being almost 400 pounds, and now I think he's around 310, 325, and he's a kid's like a dancing bear, man. A kid's nimble, kid's big, and that kid definitely clogs up all the holes in front of him. Yeah, I mean, and again, we just – it's interesting, right, because we were so excited for the D-line two years ago, and, like, Big Marv just let us down so much. I think – um one guy I talked to put it perfectly. They were like, dude, he's a turnstile. He just doesn't have any legs. He stands straight up, lets himself get spun around. And it was like, well, if that's happening to him and he's still playing out there all the time, these guys behind him can't be that great. But then last year, Fabian really stepped up and we saw Coop like, oh, he can keep his weight in check. So it was a nice surprise. And I'm just hoping that they like, you know, sometimes if something is so good because you weren't expecting it to be good, you can really have that sophomore slump, so to speak. And I'm really hopeful that doesn't happen. And I'm also confident it won't. Now, before we go over to offense, folks, y'all know today's Selection Sunday. If you're a Florida State basketball fan, you'd probably rather forget that today, as I record this, was Selection Sunday. But that's okay. It's not about one team. It's about the brackets. And this year, we are using runyourpool.com. Along with standard brackets, Run Your Pool offers game types like Survivor or Pick X. Those are both really fun in their own way. They have their options to edit scoring, and they offer more intel to make your picks. All the stuff you won't find at like an ESPN or CBS. If you've got a business, Run Your Pool can help you take some of that madness, magic, and play alongside your employees or even gain customers. Plus, they offer full white glove customer support, custom branding, and one of the easiest three-minute setups you will ever find. Clearly, we believe in Run Your Pool because we are setting up brackets ourselves, and there's no truer test than that. If you want to play against us and the rest of the Locked On Network for a shot at a cash prize of up to $1,800, well, you got to join us at runyourpool.com slash locked on. And while you're there, create your own pool for your friends and family. Enter Pure Madness at checkout for $10 off your custom pool. That's runyourpool.com slash locked on for your chance to win a cash prize of up to $1,800 and play against me, Drake, and the rest of the Locked On Network. And once you've made your bracket and you're looking at individual games, you're probably going to want to put some action on those two. So the only place to do that is bet online, go to betonline.net. That will give you all the info you need. And then make sure you go to bet online to place your bets, make your account. Now it's free to make. And when you use promo code locked on at bet online, they will give you a welcome bonus 50% of your deposit Throw in a hundred. They'll give you an extra 50 on top of it. Bet online where the game starts. All right, man. Continuing the two for Tuesday trend. Most important duo on offense. Who are you going with there? I think the most important duo on offense, I'm probably going to go with Cameron McDonald. Interesting. And, and I think another another pick will probably be whoever is tied into. And I think that primarily is going to come down to maybe Johnny Wilson going in that slot. But from some – from one of the things that we see a lot of like Cam McDonald actually in space is really good with his hands. And we don't see a lot of him actually being utilized overall in a majority of, you know, the offensive play call in the past, you know, two seasons under Mike Norvell, even though you see actually at Memphis, he does like to utilize his tight ends a lot, whether it be for blocking or whether it be actually catching in space. We saw Jordan Wilson for crying out loud, caught a you know, decent amount of balls last year, right? When he wasn't dropping them. But to me, it is best. So Cam McDonald to me is someone that needs to step up and actually finally live up to his his high four star, almost five star building from California. And then with tight end two, because I think Johnny Wilson might eventually go there because he's going to be a matchup nightmare for every linebacking core actually in the conference. And if that's not him, it's going to come down to either a Jackson West, who's a second year coming in here, or maybe sneaky player to actually get a lot get a lot of burn as a freshman. Maybe Brian Courtney, the kid that you know was a super athletic uh, quarterback out of Virginia who is someone that we need that like, we just need to have more options or more weapons available because the weapons that we've had with a Keyshawn Helton with a Jordan Young or Ontario Wilson, while both the two form, uh, former names were improved last year, 
they weren't sustainable weapons overall in the offense. And if we want to take the next step as a decent football team, we actually do need to be a threat in the passing game. So for me, it's Cam McDonald and whoever is tied into. You know, Cam McDonald was second on the team in passing to or uh, receiving touchdowns last year. Really? He had two. And that was good for second on the team. So yeah, we, we need to be more of a threat in the passing game this year. I completely agree. In fact, my two most important duos on the team, other than Jordan's left leg, his right leg. My most important duo uh, on this team is, is going to be Ja'Kai Douglas and Treshawn Ward. And I know that seems like how are they a duo because I think that they both have potential to be your best pass catchers out of the backfield and in gadgety ways, right? Whether it's lining up in that squat back, H-back position going in motion, whether it's coming from the true halfback or lining up at a really narrow slot motioning into the wheel route. They're your wheel route guys. And I think that if they can both do what they managed to do last year and kind of be those big play threats, more so Ja'Kai, right? Like he's more of that downfield big play threat. Whereas I think that Treshawn is more of a maybe angle route over the middle catch it. But if he breaks one tackle, it's a 60 yard gain. If they can be effective, I don't want to say dump off because those like that's where the ball's intended to go, but routes that you typically wouldn't see as your X route that are intended to go for big plays. I think we could have a really successful uh, season because those are the type of games that shift plays. I mean, look at Miami, right? That's your ta- that Ja'Kai Douglas pass when we're on our 20. That's the whole game right there. Those kind of plays can literally flip the field in a moment when you need them. And if we can find those three or four times in one score games, that might be three or four games that you win that you could have lost otherwise. So it's a bit of a stretch to call them a twofer, but it's making the point overall that we've got to have big play threats this year that can really go deep or we're going to struggle. Because like we said, this team is not a three da- three yards in a cloud of dust type team. This is a team where it's like jab, 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 and then they've got to hit you with a haymaker. It's just the DNA of a Mike Norvell team, I think. And it's got to be something that this team can put into practice. And I think Ja'Kai Douglas and Treshawn Ward in a variety of ways are going to be two guys that can do that for you. I'm surprised you didn't pick D.J. Williams and Treshawn Ward because I know how much you, you love D.J. Williams. Yeah, though, like- yeah. Yeah, I would have if I was just looking at the running game because I do think having two backs, but I'm not, you know, as pessimistic as I am about him, I think it's kind of like how people are about their little brother. Like, I haven't given up on Lawrence Toa Philly yet either. Like, I don't know. I'm a little disappointed by his size that he can't seem to gain any weight. But I don't know, like, I don't know if it's a two-man backfield this year. I've also heard, like, from everywhere, right, podcasts, Sorry, no offense, fans. I don't like really pay attention to what someone told you when you post on message boards, but people that, but even those guys are saying it. People that I talk to around the program, everyone's saying that Benson's actually coming along. I, I think that to say he's like an NFL talent or anything like that's a little bit premature. over the top and premature, but I think that I've heard nothing but good things. So that's four guys you have in your backfield with Treshawn Ward, DJ Williams. Um, uh, uh, sorry, Lawrence Toa Philly and Benson that all could be good backs for you with Treshawn Ward definitely being number one. And I think you'll need that other three deep roster as runners to take some pressure off of Treshawn and let him hit those passing routes out of the backfield because we saw him be good at it last year and hopefully he'll be good at it this year. I can but get folks, behind that. I mean, like the, you got the full horseman of the run apocalypse back there. And I think the Benson, full horseman of the run and I, I knew you'd enjoy that. I would, with Benson, I mean, he's the fastest kid in the team, apparently at 215. And that, if you see like his, like, you know, recovery wise, that knee looks like you're saying, you know, I think a week ago, Martin Madison has made a tremendous jump from what we remember, like an ACL back in the day was literally a, like a basically a death sentence to your athletic career. And nowadays, yeah, more like, you might, you might just come back even better. It's like Tommy John in baseball, too, where you can throw faster. Yeah. So to me, like the Jagai Douglas pick, I like a lot. Lawrence Tofili, I'm a little more out on him mainly because I did is the weight thing. And I just, I, he just seems like someone that when he gets hit, he's going to, he's going to hit, hurt him a lot more. Kind of like how JT is a kind of a similar frame too, as well. That's why with AJ Duffy, when I see that, I'm like, okay, he's 225, 230 at the, a little taller than JT. He might have the durability like a little better than him. So we'll see. But I do think that Jagai Douglas is integral to this team for his big playability, like you said, with Miami. Or maybe, you know, you're right, LT9, he had that big, that amazing catch and run and not tackle actually against Clemson. So maybe yeah. we'll have to see that. So the butt bounce. Yeah. And the other, the last thing I'll say about Ja'Kai Douglas, the reason I'm I'm pretty high on him is last year he was able to do that when we didn't have another threat to go deep. The idea is that this year you'll have three or four receivers that can be threats to go deep. So maybe when he's running that wheel route, 
you can actually have legitimate vertical threats clearing out space for him and get him even more open. I also just like his size. I mean, he weighed into the camp, I think at 205 or 210. I mean, he's, he's thicker than people give him credit for. Like he's not Lawrence Toafili where he's a quick scat back. He's actually kind of a built dude. So I'm looking forward to what he can do this year. And folks, I am looking forward to doing the rest of the off season with you. I'm looking forward to doing the season with you. And I'm looking forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. I'm Max, that was Drake, and this was Tuesday's edition of Locked on Seminoles. See y'all tomorrow. Take care, everybody.